The House on the Borderland by William Hope Hodgson. The Finding of the Manuscript Right away in the west of Ireland lies a tiny hamlet called Creighton. It is situated alone at the base of a low hill. Far around there spreads a waste of bleak and totally inhospitable country, where, here and there at great intervals, one may come upon the ruins of some long, desolate cottage, unthatched and stark. The whole land is bare and unpeopled, the very earth scarcely covering the rock that lies beneath it, and with which the country abounds, in places rising out of the soil in wave-shaped ridges. Yet in spite of its desolation, my friend Tonneson and I had elected to spend our vacation there. He had stumbled on the place by mere chance the year previously, during the course of a long walking tour, and discovered the possibilities for the angler in a small and unnamed river that runs past the outskirts of the little village. I have said that the river is without name. I may add that no map that I have hitherto consulted has shown either village or stream. They seem to have entirely escaped observation. Indeed, they might never exist at all that the average guide tells one. Possibly, this can be partly accounted for by the fact that the nearest railway station, Ardrahan, is some forty miles distant. It was early one warm evening when my friend and I arrived in Creighton. We had reached Ardrahan previous night, sleeping there in rooms hired at the village post office, and leaving in good time on the following morning, clinging insecurely to one of the typical jaunting cars. It had taken us all day to accomplish our journey over some of the roughest tracks imaginable, with the result that we were thoroughly tired and somewhat bad-tempered. However, the tent had to be erected, and our goods stowed away before we could think of food or rest. And so we set to work with the aid of our driver, and soon had the tent up upon a small patch of ground just outside the little village, and quite near to the river. Then, having stored all our belongings, we dismissed the driver, as he had to make his way back as speedily as possible, and told him to come across to us at the end of a fortnight. We had brought sufficient provisions to last us for that space of time, and water we could get from the stream. Fuel we did not need, as we had included a small oil stove among our outfit, and the weather was fine and warm. It was Tonneson's idea to camp out instead of getting lodgings in one of the cottages. As he put it, there was no joke in sleeping in a room with a numerous family of healthy Irish in one corner and the pigsty in the other, while overhead a ragged colony of roosting fowls distributed their blessings impartially, and the whole place so full of peat smoke that it made a fellow sneeze his head off just to put it inside the doorway. Tonneson had got the stove lit now and was busy cutting slices of bacon into the frying pan so I took the kettle and walked down to the river for water. On the way, I had to pass close to a little group of the village people, who eyed me curiously, but not in any unfriendly manner, though none of them ventured a word. As I returned with my kettle filled, I went up to them, and, after a friendly nod, to which they replied in like manner, I asked them casually about the fishing. But instead of answering, they just shook their heads silently and stared at me. I repeated the question, addressing more particularly a great gaunt fellow at my elbow, yet again I received no answer. Then the man turned to a comrade and said something rapidly in a language that I did not understand, and at once the whole crowd of them fell to jabbering in what, after a few moments, I guessed to be pure Irish. At the same time, they cast many glances in my direction. For a minute, perhaps, they spoke amongst themselves thus. Then the man I had addressed faced round at me and said something. By the expression of his face, 
I guessed that he, in turn, was questioning me. But now I had to shake my head and indicate that I did not comprehend what it was they wanted to know. And so we stood looking at one another, until I heard Tonneson calling to me to hurry up with the kettle. Then, with a smile and a nod, I left them, and all in the little crowd smiled and nodded in return, though their faces still betrayed their puzzlement. It was evident, I reflected as I went towards the tent, that the inhabitants of these few huts in the wilderness did not know a word of English, and when I told Tonneson, he remarked that he was aware of the fact, and more, that it was not at all uncommon in that part of the country, where the people often lived and died in their isolated hamlets, without ever coming in contact with the outside world. I wish we had got the driver to interpret before us before he left, I remarked, as we sat down to our meal. It seems so strange for the people of this place not even to know what we've come for. Tonneson grunted an assent, and thereafter was silent for a while. Later, after having satisfied our appetites somewhat, we began to talk, laying our plans for the morrow. Then, after a smoke, we closed the flap of the tent and prepared to turn in. I suppose there's no chance of those fellows outside taking anything, I asked, as we rolled ourselves in our blankets. Tonneson said that he did not think so, at least while we were about, and as he went on to explain, we could lock up everything except the tent in the big chest that we had brought to hold our provisions. I agreed to this, and soon we were both asleep. Next morning early, we rose and went for a swim in the river, after which we dressed and had breakfast. Then we roused out our fishing tackle and overhauled it, by which time, our breakfast having settled somewhat, we made all secure within the tent, and strode off in the direction my friend had explored on his previous visit. During the day we fished happily, working steadily upstream, and by evening we had one of the prettiest creels of fish that I had seen for a long while. Returning to the village, we made a good feed off our day's spoil, after which, having selected a few of the finer fish for our breakfast, we presented the remainder to the group of villagers who had assembled at a respectful distance to watch our doings. They seemed wonderfully grateful, and heaped mountains of what I presumed to be Irish blessings upon our heads. Thus we spent several days, having splendid sport and first-rate appetites to do justice upon our prey. We were pleased to find how friendly the villagers were inclined to be, and that there was no evidence of their having ventured to meddle with our belongings during our absences. It was on a Tuesday that we arrived in Creighton, and it would be on the Sunday following that we made a great discovery. Hitherto we had always gone upstream. On that day, however, we laid aside our rods, and, taking some provisions, set off for a long ramble in the opposite direction. The day was warm, and we trudged along leisurely enough, stopping about midday to eat our lunch upon a great flat rock near the river bank. Afterward, we sat and smoked a while, resuming our walk only when we were tired of inaction. For perhaps another hour we wandered onward, chatting quietly and comfortably on this and that matter, and on several occasions stopping while my companion, who was something of an artist, made rough sketches of striking bits in the wild scenery. And then, without any warning whatsoever, the river we had followed so confidently came to an abrupt end, vanishing into the earth. Good Lord, I said, who would ever have thought of this? And I stared in amazement. Then I turned to Tonneson. He was looking, with a blank expression upon his face, at the place where the river disappeared. In a moment he spoke. Let us go on a bit. It may reappear again. Anyhow, it is worth investigating. I agreed, and we went forward once more, though rather aimlessly, for we were not at all certain in which direction to prosecute our search. For perhaps a mile we moved onward, then Tonneson, who had been gazing about curiously, stopped and shaded his eyes. 
See, he said, after a moment, isn't that mist or something over there to the right, away in a line with that great piece of rock? And he indicated with his hand. I stared, and after a minute, seemed to see something, but could not be certain, and said so. Anyway, my friend replied, we'll just go across and have a glance. And he started off in the direction he had suggested, I following. Presently, we came among bushes, and, after a time, out upon the top of a high, boulder-strewn bank, from which we looked down into a wilderness of bushes and trees. "'Seems as though we had come upon an oasis in this desert of stone,' muttered Tonneson, as he gazed interestedly. Then he was silent, his eyes fixed, and I looked also, for up from somewhere about the center of the wooded lowland there rose high into the quiet air a great column of haze-like spray upon which the sun shone, causing innumerable rainbows. "'How beautiful!' I exclaimed. "'Yes,' answered Tonneson, thoughtfully. "'There must be a waterfall or something over there. "'Perhaps it's our river come to light again. "'Let's go and see.' "'Down the sloping bank we made our way, "'and entered among the trees and shrubberies. "'The bushes were matted, and the trees overhung us, "'so that the place was disagreeably gloomy, "'though not dark enough to hide from me the fact "'that many of the trees were fruit trees.' and that, here and there, one could trace indistinctly signs of a long-departed cultivation. Thus it came to me that we were making our way through the riot of a great and ancient garden. I said as much to Tonneson, and he agreed that there certainly seemed reasonable grounds for my belief. What a wild place it was, so dismal and somber! Somehow, as we went forward, a sense of the silent loneliness and desertion of the old garden grew upon me, and I felt shivery. One could imagine things lurking among the tangled bushes, while, in the very air of the place, there seemed something uncanny. I think Tonneson was conscious of this also, though he said nothing. Suddenly we came to a halt. Through the trees there had grown upon our ears a distant sound, Tonneson bent forward, listening. I could hear it more plainly now. It was continuous and harsh, a sort of droning roar seeming to come from far away. I experienced a queer, indescribable little feeling of nervousness. What sort of place was it into which we had got? I looked at my companion to see what he thought of the matter, and noticed that there was only puzzlement in his face. And then... As I watched his features, an expression of comprehension crept over them, and he nodded his head. "'That's a waterfall!' he exclaimed, with conviction. "'I know the sound now!' And he began to push vigorously through the bushes in the direction of the noise. As we went forward, the sound became plainer continually, showing that we were heading straight toward it. Steadily, the roaring grew louder and nearer, until it appeared, as I remarked to Tonneson, almost to come from under our feet, and still we were surrounded by the trees and shrubs. "'Take care,' Tonneson called to me. "'Look where you're going.' And then suddenly we came out from among the trees onto a great open space, where not six paces in front of us yawned the mouth of a tremendous chasm, from the depths of which the noise appeared to rise along with the continuous mist-like spray that we had witnessed from the top of the distant bank. For quite a minute we stood in silence, staring in bewilderment at the sight. Then my friend went forward cautiously to the edge of the abyss. I followed, and together we looked down through a boil of spray at a monster cataract of frothing water that burst spouting from the side of the chasm nearly a hundred feet below. "'Good Lord!' said Tonneson. I was silent and rather awed. The sight was so unexpectedly grand and eerie, though this latter quality came more upon me later. Presently I looked up and across to the further side of the chasm. There I saw something towering up among the spray. It looked like a fragment of a great ruin, and I touched Tonneson on the shoulder. 
He glanced round with a start, and I pointed towards the thing. His gaze followed my finger, and his eyes lighted up with a sudden flash of excitement as the object came within his field of view. Come along, he shouted above the uproar. We'll have a look at it. There's something queer about this place. I feel it in my bones. And he started off round the edge of the crater-like abyss. As we neared this new thing, I saw that I had not been mistaken in my first impression. It was undoubtedly a portion of some ruined building. Yet now I made out that it was not built upon the edge of the chasm itself, as I had first supposed, but perched almost at the extreme end of a huge spur of rock that jutted out some fifty or sixty feet over the abyss. In fact, the jagged mass of ruin was literally suspended in mid-air. Arriving opposite it, we walked out onto the projecting arm of rock, and I must confess to having felt an intolerable sense of terror as I looked down from that dizzy perch into the unknown depths below us, into the deeps from which there rose ever the thunder of the falling water and the shroud of rising spray. Reaching the ruin, we clambered round it cautiously, and on the further side came upon a mass of fallen stones and rubble. The ruin itself seemed to me, as I proceeded now to examine it minutely, to be a portion of the outer wall of some prodigious structure. It was so thick and substantially built, yet what was it doing in such a position I could by no means conjecture. Where was the rest of the house, or castle, or whatever there had been? I went back to the outer side of the wall, and thence to the edge of the chasm leaving Tonneson rooting systematically among the heaps of stones and rubbish on the outer side. Then I commenced to examine the surface of the ground, near the edge of the abyss, to see whether there were not left other remnants of the building to which the fragment of ruin evidently belonged. But though I scrutinized the earth with the greatest care, I could see no signs of anything to show that there had ever been a building erected on the spot and I grew more puzzled than ever. Then I heard a cry from Tonneson. He was shouting my name excitedly, and without delay I hurried along the rocky promontory to the ruin. I wondered whether he had hurt himself, and then the thought came that perhaps he had found something. I reached the crumbled wall and climbed round. There I found Tonneson standing within a small excavation that he had made among the debris. He was brushing the dirt from something that looked like a book, much crumpled and dilapidated, and opening his mouth every second or two to bellow my name. As soon as he saw that I had come, he handed his prize to me, telling me to put it into my satchel so as to protect it from the damp, while he continued his explorations. This I did, first, however, running the pages through my fingers, and noting that they were closely filled with neat, old-fashioned writing which was quite legible, save in one portion where many of the pages were almost destroyed, being muddied and crumpled, as though the book had been doubled back at that part. This, I found out from Tonneson, was actually as he had discovered it, and the damage was due, probably, to the fall of masonry upon the opened part. Curiously enough, the book was fairly dry, which I attributed to its having been so securely buried among the ruins. Having put the volume away safely, I turned to and gave Tonneson a hand with his self-imposed task of excavating. Yet, though we put in over an hour's hard work, turning over the whole of the upheaped stones and rubbish, we came upon nothing more than some fragments of broken wood that might have been parts of a desk or table, and so he gave up searching and went back along the rock once more to the safety of the land. The next thing we did was to make a complete tour of the tremendous chasm, which we were able to observe was in the form of an almost perfect circle, save for where the ruin-crowned spur of rock jutted out, spoiling its symmetry. The abyss was, as Tonneson put it, 
like nothing so much as a gigantic well or pit going sheer down into the bowels of the earth. For some time longer, we continued to stare about us, and then, noticing that there was a clear space away to the north of the chasm, we bent our steps in that direction. Here, distant from the mouth of the mighty pit by some hundreds of yards, we came upon a great lake of silent water, silent, that is, save in one place where there was a continuous bubbling and gurgling. Now, being away from the noise of the spouting cataract, we were able to hear one another speak without having to shout at the tops of our voices, and I asked Tonneson what he thought of the place. I told him that I didn't like it, and the sooner we were out of it, the better I should be pleased. He nodded in reply and glanced at the woods behind furtively. I asked him if he had seen or heard anything. He made no answer, but stood silent as though listening, and I kept quiet also. Suddenly he spoke. Hark, he said sharply. I looked at him, and then away among the trees and bushes, holding my breath involuntarily. A minute came and went in strained silence. Yet I could hear nothing, and I turned to Tonneson to say as much, and then... Even as I opened my lips to speak, there came a strange wailing noise out of the wood on our left. It appeared to float through the trees, and there was a rustle of stirring leaves, and then silence. All at once, Tonneson spoke and put his hand on my shoulder. Let us get out of here, he said, and began to move slowly toward where the surrounding trees and bushes seemed thinnest. As I followed him, it came to me suddenly that the sun was low, and that there was a raw sense of chilliness in the air. Tonneson said nothing further, but kept on steadily. We were among the trees now, and I glanced around nervously, but saw nothing, save the quiet branches and trunks and the tangled bushes. Onward we went, and no sound broke the silence, except the occasional snapping of a twig under our feet as we moved forward. Yet, in spite of the quietness, I had a horrible feeling that we were not alone, and I kept so close to Tonneson that twice I kicked his heels clumsily, though he said nothing. A minute, and then another, and we reached the confines of the woods, coming out at last upon the bare rockiness of the countryside. Only then was I able to shake off the haunting dread that had followed me among the trees. Once, as we moved away, there seemed to come again a distant sound of wailing, and I said to myself that it was the wind, yet the evening was breathless. Presently, Tonneson began to talk. Look you, he said with decision, I would not spend the night in that place for all the wealth the world holds. There is something unholy, diabolical about it. It came to me all in a moment just after you spoke. It seemed to me that the woods were full of vile things, you know. Yes, I answered, and looked back towards the place. But it was hidden from us by a rise in the ground. There's the book, I said, and I put my hand into the satchel. You've got it safely, he questioned, with a sudden access of anxiety. Yes, I replied. Perhaps, he continued, we shall learn something from it when we get back to the tent. We had better hurry, too. We're a long way off still, and I don't fancy now being caught out here in the dark. It was two hours later when we reached the tent, and without delay we set to work to prepare a meal, for we had eaten nothing since our lunch at midday. Supper over, we cleared the things out of the way and lit our pipes. Then Tonneson asked me to get the manuscript out of my satchel. This I did, and then, as we could not both read from it at the same time, he suggested that I should read the thing loud. And mind, he cautioned, knowing my propensities, don't go skipping half the book. Yet, had he but known what it contained, he would have realized how needless such advice was, for once at least. And there, seated in the opening of our little tent, I began the strange tale of the house on the borderland, for such was the title of the manuscript. This is told in the following pages.
the plain of silence. I am an old man. I live here in this ancient house, surrounded by huge, unkempt gardens. The peasantry, who inhabit the wilderness beyond, say that I am mad. That is because I will have nothing to do with them. I live here alone with my old sister, who is also my housekeeper. We keep no servants. I hate them. I have one friend, a dog. Yes, I would sooner have old Pepper than the rest of creation together. He at least understands me, and has sense enough to leave me alone when I am in my dark moods. I have decided to start a kind of diary. It may enable me to record some of the thoughts and feelings that I cannot express to anyone. But beyond this, I am anxious to make some record of the strange things that I have heard and seen during many years of loneliness in this weird old building. For a couple of centuries, this house has had a reputation, a bad one, and until I bought it, for more than eighty years no one had lived here. Consequently, I got the old place at a ridiculously low figure. I am not superstitious, but I have ceased to deny that things happen in this old house, things that I cannot explain, and therefore I must needs ease my mind by writing down an account of them to the best of my ability. Though should this my diary ever be read when I am gone, the readers will but shake their heads and be the more convinced that I was mad. This house, how ancient it is! Though its ages strike one less, perhaps, than the quaintness of the structure, which is curious and fantastic to the last degree. Little curved towers and pinnacles, with outlines suggestive of leaping flames, predominate while the body of the building is in the form of a circle. I have heard that there is an old story, told amongst the country people, to the effect that the devil built the place. However, that is as may be. True or not, I neither know nor care, save as it may have helped to cheapen it ere I came. I must have been here some ten years before I saw sufficient to warrant any belief in the stories, current in the neighborhood about this house. It is true that I had, on at least a dozen occasions, seen vaguely things that puzzled me, and perhaps had felt more than I had seen. Then, as the years passed, bringing age upon me, I became often aware of something unseen, yet unmistakably present, in the empty rooms and corridors. Still, it was, as I have said, many years before I saw any real manifestations of the so-called supernatural. It was not Halloween. If I were telling a story for amusement's sake, I should probably place it on that night of nights, but this is a true record of my own experiences, and I would not put pen to paper to amuse anyone. No. It was after midnight, on the morning of the 21st day of January, I was sitting reading, as is often my custom, in my study. Pepper lay sleeping near my chair. Without warning, the flames of the two candles went low, and then shone with a ghastly green effulgence. I looked up quickly, and as I did so I saw the light sink into a dull, ruddy tint, so that the rooms glowed with a strange, heavy, crimson twilight that gave the shadows behind the chairs and tables a double depth of blackness. And wherever the light struck, it was as though luminous blood had been splashed over the room. Down on the floor I heard a faint, frightened whimper, and something pressed itself in between my two feet. It was Pepper, cowering under my dressing gown. Pepper, usually as brave as a lion. It was this movement of the dogs, I think, that gave me the first twinge of real fear. I had been considerably startled when the lights burnt first green and then red, but had been momentarily under the impression that the change was due to some influx of noxious gas into the room. Now, however, I saw that it was not so, for the candles burned with a steady flame, 
and showed no signs of going out, as would have been the case had the change been due to fumes in the atmosphere. I did not move. I felt distinctly frightened, but could think of nothing better to do than wait. For perhaps a minute, I kept my glance about the room nervously. Then I noticed that the lights had commenced to sink very slowly, until presently they showed minute specks of red fire, like the gleamings of rubies in the darkness. Still I sat watching, while a sort of dreamy indifference seemed to steal over me, banishing altogether the fear that had begun to grip me. Away in the far end of the old-fashioned room, I became conscious of a faint glow. Steadily it grew, filling the room with gleams of quivering green light. Then they sank quickly and changed, even as the candle flames had done, into a deep, somber crimson that strengthened and lit up the room with a flood of awful glory. The light came from the end wall, and grew ever brighter until its intolerable glare caused my eyes acute pain, and involuntarily I closed them. It may have been a few seconds before I was able to open them. The first thing I noticed was that the light had decreased greatly, so that it no longer tried my eyes. Then, as it grew still duller, I was aware, all at once, that, instead of looking at the redness, I was staring through it, and through the wall beyond. Gradually, as I became more accustomed to the idea, I realized that I was looking out onto a vast plain, lit with the same gloomy twilight that pervaded the room. The immensity of this plain scarcely can be conceived. In no part could I perceive its confines. It seemed to broaden and spread out, so that the eye failed to perceive any limitations. Slowly the details of the nearer portions began to grow clear. Then in a moment almost, the light died away, and the vision, if vision it were, faded and was gone. Suddenly, I became conscious that I was no longer in the chair. Instead, I seemed to be hovering above it, and looking down at a dim something huddled and silent. In a little while, a cold blast struck me, and I was outside in the night floating like a bubble up through the darkness. As I moved, an icy coldness seemed to enfold me, so that I shivered. After a time, I looked to right and left, and saw the intolerable blackness of the night, pierced by remote gleams of fire. Onward, outward I drove. Once I glanced behind and saw the earth, a small crescent of blue light, receding away to my left. Further off, the sun, a splash of white flame, burned vividly against the dark. An indefinite period passed. Then, for the last time, I saw the earth, an enduring globule of radiant blue swimming in an eternity of ether. And there I, a fragile flake of soul dust, flickered silently across the void from the distant blue into the expanse of the unknown. A great while seemed to pass over me, and now I could nowhere see anything. I had passed beyond the fixed stars, and plunged into the huge blackness that waits beyond. All this time I had experienced little, save a sense of lightness and cold discomfort. Now, however, the atrocious darkness seemed to creep into my soul, and I became filled with fear and despair. What was going to become of me? Where was I going? Even as the thoughts were formed, there grew against the impalpable blackness that wrapped me a faint tinge of blood. It seemed extraordinarily remote and mist-like, yet at once the feeling of oppression was lightened, and I no longer despaired. Slowly, the distant redness became plainer and larger, until, as I drew nearer, it spread out into a great somber glare dull and tremendous. Still I fled onward, and presently I had come so close that it seemed to stretch beneath me, like a great ocean of somber red. I could see little, save that it appeared to spread out interminably in all directions. In a further space, 
I found that I was descending upon it, and soon I sank into a great sea of sullen, red-hued clouds. Slowly I emerged from these, and there below me I saw the stupendous plain that I had seen from my room in this house that stands upon the borders of the silences. Presently I landed and stood, surrounded by a great waste of loneliness. The place was lit with a gloomy twilight that gave an impression of indescribable desolation. Afar to my right, within the sky, there burnt a gigantic ring of dull red fire, from the outer edge of which were projected huge writhing flames, darted and jagged. The interior of this ring was black, black as the gloom of the outer night. I comprehended at once that it was from this extraordinary sun that the place derived its doleful light. From that strange source of light, I glanced down again to my surroundings. Everywhere I looked, I saw nothing but the same flat weariness of interminable plain. Nowhere could I descry any signs of life, not even the ruins of some ancient habitation. Gradually I found that I was being borne forward, floating across the flat waste. For what seemed an eternity I moved onward. I was unaware of any great sense of impatience, though some curiosity and a vast wonder were with me continually. Always I saw around me the breadth of that enormous plain, and always I searched for some new thing to break its monotony. But there was no change, only loneliness, silence, and desert. Presently, in a half-conscious manner, I noticed that there was a faint mistiness ruddy in hue, lying over its surface. Still, when I looked more intently, I was unable to say that it was really mist, for it appeared to blend with the plain, giving it a peculiar unrealness, and conveying to the senses the idea of unsubstantiality. Gradually, I began to weary with the sameness of the thing, yet it was a great time before I perceived any signs of the place towards which I was being conveyed. At first, I saw it far ahead, like a long hillock on the surface of the plain. Then, as I drew nearer, I perceived that I had been mistaken, for instead of a low hill, I made out now a chain of great mountains, whose distant peaks towered up into the red gloom until they were almost lost to sight. The house in the arena. And so, after a time, I came to the mountains. Then the course of my journey was altered, and I began to move along their bases until, all at once, I saw that I had come opposite to a vast rift opening into the mountains. Through this I was borne, moving at no great speed. On either side of me, huge scarped walls of rock like substance rose sheer. Far overhead, I discerned a thin ribbon of red where the mouth of the chasm opened among inaccessible peaks. Within was gloom, deep and somber and chilly silence. For a while, I went onward steadily, and then at last I saw ahead a deep red glow that told me I was near upon the further opening of the gorge. A minute came and went, and I was at the exit of the chasm staring out upon an enormous amphitheater of mountains. Yet of the mountains and the terrible grandeur of the place I recked nothing, for I was confounded with amazement to behold, at a distance of several miles, and occupying the center of the arena, a stupendous structure built apparently of green jade. Yet in itself it was not the discovery of the building that had so astonished me, but the fact which became every moment more apparent that in no particular save in color and its enormous size did the lonely structure vary from this house in which I live. For a while I continued to stare fixedly. Even then I could scarcely believe that I saw right. 
in my mind a question formed reiterating incessantly what does it mean what does it mean and i was unable to make answer even out of the depths of my imagination i seemed capable only of wonder and fear for a time longer i gazed noting continually some fresh point of resemblance that attracted me at last wearied and sorely puzzled i turned from it to view the rest of the strange place onto which i had intruded hitherto i had been so engrossed in my scrutiny of the house that i had given only a cursory glance round now as i looked i began to realize upon what sort of place i had come the arena for so i have termed it appeared a perfect circle of about ten to twelve miles in diameter the house as i have mentioned before standing in the center the surface of the place like to that of the plain had a peculiar misty appearance that was yet not mist from a rapid survey my glance passed quickly upward along the slopes of the circling mountains how silent they were i think that this same abominable stillness was more trying to me than anything that i had so far seen or imagined i was looking up now at the great crags towering so loftily up there the impalpable redness gave a blurred appearance to everything and then as i peered curiously a new terror came to me for away up among the dim peaks to my right i had descried a vast shape of blackness giant-like it grew upon my sight it had an enormous equine head with gigantic ears and seemed to peer steadfastly down into the arena there was that about the pose that gave me the impression of an eternal watchfulness of having warded that dismal place through unknown eternities slowly the monster became plainer to me and then suddenly my gaze sprang from it to something further off and higher among the crags for a long minute i gazed fearfully i was strangely conscious of something not altogether unfamiliar as though something stirred in the back of my mind the thing was black and had four grotesque arms the features showed indistinctly round the neck i made out several light-colored objects slowly the details came to me and i realized coldly that they were skulls further down the body was another circling belt showing less dark against the black trunk then even as i puzzled to know what the thing was a memory slid into my mind and straightway i knew that i was looking at a monstrous representation of kali the hindu goddess of death other remembrances of my old student days drifted into my thoughts my glance fell back upon the huge beast-headed thing simultaneously i recognized it for the ancient egyptian god set or seth the destroyer of souls with the knowledge there came a great sweep of questioning two of the i stopped and endeavored to think things beyond my imagination peered into my frightened mind i saw obscurely the old gods of mythology I tried to comprehend to what it was all pointing. My gaze dwelt flickeringly between the two. If an idea came swiftly and I turned and glanced rapidly upward, searching the gloomy crags away to my left, something loomed out under a great peak, a shape of grayness. I wondered I had not seen it earlier and then remembered I had not yet viewed that portion. I saw it more plainly now. It was, as I have said, gray. It had a tremendous head, but no eyes. That part of its face was blank. Now I saw that there were other things up among the mountains. Further off, reclining on a lofty ledge, I made out a livid mass, irregular and ghoulish. It seemed without form, save for an unclean half-animal face that looked out vilely from somewhere about its middle and then i saw others there were hundreds of them 
They seemed to grow out of the shadows. Several I recognized almost immediately as mythological deities. Others were strange to me, utterly strange, beyond the power of a human mind to conceive. On each side I looked and saw more continually. The mountains were full of strange things, beast gods, and horrors so atrocious and bestial that possibility and decency deny any further attempt to describe them. And I, I was filled with a terrible sense of overwhelming horror and fear and repugnance, yet in spite of these, I wondered exceedingly. Was there then, after all, something in the old heathen worship, something more than the mere deifying of men and animals and elements? The thought gripped me. Was there? Later a question repeated itself. What were they, those beast gods and the others? At first, they had appeared to me just sculptured monsters placed indiscriminately among the inaccessible peaks and precipices of the surrounding mountains. Now, as I scrutinized them with greater intentness, my mind began to reach out to fresh conclusions. There was something about them, an indescribable sort of silent vitality that suggested, to my broadening consciousness, a state of life in death. A something that was by no means life as we understand it, but rather an inhuman form of existence that well might be likened to a deathless trance, a condition in which it was possible to imagine their continuing eternally. Immortal. The word rose in my thoughts unbidden, and straightway I grew to wondering whether this might be the immortality of the gods. And then, in the midst of my wondering and musing, something happened. Until then, I had been staying just within the shadow of the exit of the great rift. Now, without volition on my part, I drifted out of the semi-darkness and began to move slowly across the arena toward the house. At this, I gave up all thoughts of those prodigious shapes above me, and could only stare frightenedly at the tremendous structure towards which I was being conveyed so remorselessly. Yet though I searched earnestly, I could discover nothing that I had not already seen, and so became gradually calmer. Presently, I had reached a point more than halfway between the house and the gorge. All around, was spread the stark loneliness of the place and the unbroken silence. Steadily, I neared the great building. Then all at once something caught my vision, something that came round one of the huge buttresses of the house, and so into full view. It was a gigantic thing, and moved with a curious lope, going almost upright after the manner of a man. It was quite unclothed, and had a remarkable luminous appearance. Yet it was the face that attracted and frightened me the most. It was the face of a swine. Silently, intently I watched this horrible creature, and forgot my fear momentarily in my interest in its movements. It was making its way cumbrously round the building, stopping as it came to each window to peer in and shake at the bars, with which, as in this house, they were protected. And whenever it came to a door, it would push at it, fingering the fastening stealthily. Evidently, it was searching for an ingress into the house. I had now come to within less than a quarter of a mile of the great structure, and still I was compelled forward. Abruptly, the thing turned and gazed hideously in my direction. It opened its mouth, and for the first time the stillness of that abominable place was broken by a deep, booming note that sent an added thrill of apprehension through me. Then immediately I became aware that it was coming toward me, swiftly and silently. In an instant it had covered half the distance that lay between, and still I was borne helplessly to meet it. Only a hundred yards, and the brutish ferocity of the giant face numbed me with a feeling of unmitigated horror. I could have screamed, in the supremeness of my fear, and then, in the very moment of my extremity and despair, I became conscious that I was looking down upon the arena 
from a rapidly increasing height. I was rising, rising. In an inconceivably short while, I had reached an altitude of many hundred feet. Beneath me, the spot that I had just left was occupied by the foul swine creature. It had gone down on all fours and was snuffling and rooting like a veritable hog at the surface of the arena. A moment, and it rose to its feet, clutching upward with an expression of desire upon its face such as I have never seen in this world. Continually I mounted higher. A few minutes, it seemed, and I had risen above the great mountains, floating alone afar in the redness. At a tremendous distance below, the arena showed dimly, with the mighty house looking no larger than a tiny spot of green. The swine thing was no longer visible. Presently, I passed over the mountains, out above the huge breadth of the plain. Far away on its surface, in the direction of the ring-shaped sun, there showed a confused blur. I looked toward it indifferently. It reminded me somewhat of the first glimpse I had caught of the mountain amphitheater. With a sense of weariness, I glanced upward at the immense ring of fire. What a strange thing it was! Then, as I stared, out from the dark center, there spurted a sudden flare of extraordinary vivid fire. Compared with the size of the black center, it was as naught, yet in itself stupendous. With awakened interest, I watched it carefully, noting its strange boiling and glowing. Then in a moment, the whole thing grew dim and unreal, and so passed out of sight. Much amazed, I glanced down to the plain from which I was still rising. Thus I received a fresh surprise. The plain, everything, had vanished, and only a sea of red mist was spread far below me. Gradually as I stared, this grew remote, and died away into a dim, far mystery of red against an unfathomable night. A while, and even this had gone, and I was wrapped in an impalpable, lightless gloom. The Earth Thus I was, and only the memory that I had lived through the dark once before served to sustain my thoughts. A great time passed, ages, and then a single star broke its way through the darkness. It was the first of one of the outlying clusters of this universe. Presently it was far behind, and all about me shone the splendor of the countless stars. Later, years it seemed, I saw the sun, a clot of flame. Around it, I made out presently several remote specks of light, the planets of the solar system. And so I saw the earth again, blue and unbelievably minute. It grew larger and became defined. A long space of time came and went, and then at last I entered into the shadow of the world, plunging headlong into the dim and holy earth night. Overhead were the old constellations, and there was a crescent moon. Then, as I neared the earth's surface, a dimness swept over me, and I appeared to sink into a black mist. For a while I knew nothing. I was unconscious. Gradually, I became aware of a faint, distant whining. It became plainer. A desperate feeling of agony possessed me. I struggled madly for breath and tried to shout. A moment, and I got my breath more easily. I was conscious that something was licking my hand. Something damp swept across my face. I heard a panting, and then again the whining. It seemed to come to my ears now with a sense of familiarity, and I opened my eyes. All was dark but the feeling of oppression had left me. I was seated, and something was whining piteously, and licking me. I felt strangely confused, and instinctively tried to ward off the thing that licked. My head was curiously vacant, and for the moment 
I seemed incapable of action or thought. Then things came back to me, and I called, Pepper, faintly. I was answered by a joyful bark and renewed and frantic caresses. In a little while I felt stronger and put out my hand for the matches. I groped about for a few moments blindly. Then my hands lit upon them and I struck a light and looked confusedly around. All about me I saw the old familiar things. And there I sat, full of dazed wonders, until the flame of the match burnt my finger, and I dropped it, while a hasty expression of pain and anger escaped my lips, surprising me with the sound of my own voice. After a moment, I struck another match, and, stumbling across the room, lit the candles. As I did so, I observed that they had not burned away, but had been put out. As the flame shot up, I turned and stared about the study, yet there was nothing unusual to see, and suddenly a gust of irritation took me. What had happened? I held my head with both hands and tried to remember. Ah, the great silent plain and the ring-shaped sun of red fire. Where were they? Where had I seen them? How long ago? I felt dazed and muddled. Once or twice I walked up and down the room unsteadily, my memory seemed dulled, and already the thing I had witnessed came back to me with an effort. I have a remembrance of cursing, peevishly, in my bewilderment. Suddenly, I turned faint and giddy, and had to grasp at the table for support. During a few moments, I held on weakly, and then managed to totter sideways into a chair. After a little time, I felt somewhat better and succeeded in reaching the cupboard where, usually, I keep brandy and biscuits. I poured myself out a little of the stimulant and drank it off. Then, taking a handful of biscuits, I returned to my chair and began to devour them ravenously. I was vaguely surprised at my hunger. I felt as though I had eaten nothing for an uncountably long while. As I ate, my glance roved about the room, taking in its various details, and still searching, though almost unconsciously, for something tangible on which to take hold amongst the invisible mysteries that encompassed me. Surely, I thought, there must be something. And, in the same instant, my gaze dwelt upon the face of the clock in the opposite corner. Therewith I stopped eating and just stared for though its ticking indicated most certainly that it was still going, the hands were pointing to a little before the hour of midnight, whereas it was, as well I knew, considerably after that time when I had witnessed the first of the strange happenings I have just described. For perhaps a moment I was astounded and puzzled. Had the hour been the same as when I had last seen the clock, I should have concluded that the hands had stuck in one place, while the internal mechanism went on as usual, but that would in no way account for the hands having traveled backward. Then, even as I turned the matter over in my wearied brain, the thought flashed upon me that it was now close upon the morning of the twenty-second, and that I had been unconscious to the visible world through the greater portion of the last twenty-four hours. The thought occupied my attention for a full minute. Then I commenced to eat again. I was still very hungry. During breakfast next morning, I inquired casually of my sister regarding the date, and found my surmise correct. I had indeed been absent, at least in spirit, for nearly a day and a night. My sister asked me no questions for it is not by any means the first time that I have kept to my study for a whole day, and sometimes a couple of days at a time, when I have been particularly engrossed in my books or work. And so the days pass on, and I am still filled with a wonder to know the meaning of all that I saw on that memorable night. Yet well I know that my curiosity is little likely to be satisfied.
a thing in the pit. This house is, as I have said before, surrounded by a huge estate and wild and uncultivated gardens. Away at the back, distant some three hundred yards, is a dark, deep ravine, spoken of as the pit by the peasantry. At the bottom runs a sluggish stream so overhung by trees as scarcely to be seen from above. In passing, I must explain that this river has a subterranean origin, emerging suddenly at the east end of the ravine and disappearing as abruptly beneath the cliffs that form its western extremity. It was some months after my vision, if vision it were, of the great plain that my attention was particularly attracted to the pit. I happened one day to be walking along its southern edge when suddenly several pieces of rock and shale were dislodged from the face of the cliff immediately beneath me and fell with a sullen crash through the trees. I heard them splash in the river at the bottom and then silence. I should not have given this incident more than a passing thought, had not Pepper at once begun to bark savagely, nor would he be silent when I bade him, which is most unusual behavior on his part. Feeling that there must be someone or something in the pit, I went back to the house quickly for a stick. When I returned, Pepper had ceased his barks and was growling and smelling uneasily along the top. Whistling to him to follow me, I started to descend cautiously. The depth to the bottom of the pit must be about a hundred and fifty feet, and some time, as well as considerable care, was expended before we reached the bottom in safety. Once down, Pepper and I started to explore among the banks of the river. It was very dark there due to the overhanging trees, and I moved warily keeping my glance about me and my stick ready. Pepper was quiet now and kept close to me all the time. Thus we searched right up one side of the river without hearing or seeing anything. Then we crossed over, by the simple method of jumping, and commenced to beat our way back through the underbrush. We had accomplished perhaps half the distance, when I heard again the sound of falling stones on the other side, the side from which we had just come. One large rock came thundering down through the treetops, struck the opposite bank, and bounded into the river, driving a great jet of water right over us. At this, Pepper gave out a deep growl, then stopped and pricked up his ears. I listened also. A second later, a loud, half-human, half-pig-like squeal sounded from among the trees, abruptly about halfway up the south cliff. It was answered by a similar note from the bottom of the pit. At this, Pepper gave a short, sharp bark, and, springing across the little river, disappeared into the bushes. Immediately afterward, I heard his barks increase in depth and number, and in between there sounded a noise of confused jabbering. This ceased, and in the succeeding silence there rose a semi-human yell of agony. Almost immediately Pepper gave a long-drawn howl of pain, and then the shrubs were violently agitated, and he came running out with his tail down and glancing as he ran over his shoulder. As he reached me, I saw that he was bleeding from what appeared to be a great claw wound in the side that had almost laid bare his ribs. Seeing Pepper thus mutilated, a furious feeling of anger seized me, and whirling my staff I sprang across and into the bushes from which Pepper had emerged. As I forced my way through, I thought I heard a sound of breathing. Next instant I had burst into a little clear space just in time to see something, livid white in color, disappear among the bushes on the opposite side. With a shout I ran toward it, but though I struck and probed among the bushes with my stick, I neither saw nor heard anything further, and so returned to Pepper. 
There, after bathing his wound in the river, I bound my wetted handkerchief around his body, having done which we retreated up the ravine and into the daylight again. On reaching the house, my sister inquired what had happened to Pepper, and I told her he had been fighting with a wildcat, of which I had heard there were several about. I knew it would be better not to tell her how it had really happened, though to be sure I scarcely knew myself. But this I did know, that the thing I had seen run into the bushes was no wildcat. It was much too big, and had, so far as I had observed, a skin like a hog's, only of a dead, unhealthy white color. And then it had run upright, or nearly so, upon its hind feet, with a motion somewhat resembling that of a human being. This much I had noticed in my brief glimpse, and truth to tell, I felt a good deal of uneasiness, besides curiosity, as I turned the matter over in my mind. It was in the morning that the above incident had occurred. Then, it would be after dinner, as I sat reading that, happening to look up suddenly, I saw something peering in over the window ledge, the eyes and ears alone showing. A pig, by Jove, I said, and rose to my feet. Thus I saw the thing more completely, but it was no pig. God alone knows what it was. It reminded me vaguely of the hideous thing that had haunted the great arena. It had a grotesquely human mouth and jaw, but with no chin of which to speak. The nose was prolonged into a snout. Thus it was that with the little eyes and queer ears gave it such an extraordinarily swine-like appearance. A forehead there was little, and the whole face was of an unwholesome white color. For perhaps a minute I stood looking at the thing with an ever-growing feeling of disgust and some fear. The mouth kept jabbering inanely and once emitted a half-swinish grunt. I think it was the eyes that attracted me the most. They seemed to glow at times with a horribly human intelligence and kept flickering away from my face over the details of the room as though my stare disturbed it. It appeared to be supporting itself by two claw-like hands upon the window sill. These claws, unlike the face, were of a clayey brown hue and bore an indistinct resemblance to human hands, in that they had four fingers and a thumb, though these were webbed up to the first joint much as are a duck's. Nails it had also, but so long and powerful that they were more like the talons of an eagle than aught else. As I have said before, I felt some fear, though almost of an impersonal kind. I may explain my feeling better by saying there was more a sensation of abhorrence, such as one might expect to feel if brought into contact with something superhumanly foul, something unholy, belonging to some hitherto undreamt-of state of existence. I cannot say that I grasped these various details of the brood at the time. I think they seemed to come back to me, afterward, as though imprinted upon my brain. I imagined more than I saw as I looked at the thing, and the material details grew upon me later. For perhaps a minute I stared at the creature. Then as my nerves steadied a little, I shook off the vague alarm that held me, and took a step toward the window. Even as I did so, the thing ducked and vanished. I rushed to the door and looked round hurriedly, but only the tangled bushes and shrubs met my gaze. 